Thank you very much, and as you've heard, normally I talk about Mount Everest. That's a very big subject. It's a subject that is close to my heart. It is a mountain on which I filmed. It's a mountain about which I have written. It is a place that in many ways changed my life. The things I saw on Everest both horrified me and enchanted me and took me to the limit uh, in many, many ways. But the experiences I've had there were just a part of the life that I've led as a filmmaker. And what I wanted to do today was to, to look back a little bit and to, to think about some of the, the, the examples I've seen of great moments of incredible leadership and uh, moments where we look at ourselves as leaders and wonder if we can uh, take that role, if we deserve that role, and if we do, uh, what will actually be the result. Now, I do a lot of school visits. I did about 100 school visits last year. And um, sometimes I'll ask the, the pupils that I speak to uh, a question or two. And for example, recently at a school in Birmingham with a, a year seven group, um, I asked that group, I said, well, look, if you could take a friend to Mount Everest, um, just one friend, who would you take? And a girl in the front row uh, put up her hand and she said, I'd take my friend. I said, oh, that's really sweet. Um, why would you take your friend? And she looked at me and she said, this is actually what she said, she said, um, if, I, if things went wrong and I got into trouble, I could eat her, which I thought <laughs> an absolutely brilliant answer. I've got a horrible feeling she actually meant it. At another school, um, I asked a different question. I said, look, if you were on the summit of Mount Everest and you could make one radio call, just one call, uh, because your batteries were going dead, who is it that you call? And a boy put up his hand and he said, Domino's Pizza, <laughs> which is... Another brilliant, brilliant uh, idea. But for today, what I wanted to do was to tell you a brief story about something that happened to me in my childhood and how that led me into an interest uh, in the Stone Age and uh, into an educational uh, career in archaeology, which was where, I, where, where that was my study. And this came from, uh, directly from my first experiences of exploration. Now, I'm sure everybody in the room knows the feeling when you're about 10, you get the urge to, to go out and explore, and that certainly happened to me. With a few friends, after school, we used to go to the local canal. And this was, I guess, 100 years ago, a mighty kind of thoroughfare, of an amazing transport route in which goods were transported by, by narrow boats. And uh, by the time we went down there, it was a pretty polluted, rather kind of uh, fetid uh, waterway, which was a bit stagnant, to be honest. That was where we went for our adventures. And to, to have an adventure, we would basically go out after school and we'd go down to the canal and, for example, we would build a, a raft. And we'd put it out onto the water and we'd sail a bit and mess around and invariably it would sink and we'd get extremely wet and get into trouble when we went home. Uh, on other occasions, we went down there and we would fish or try to fish. And these early adventures were, in a way, a type of exploration for me. But one particular moment uh, was a moment of great mystery to me, and it actually pushed my whole life <clears throat> in a different direction. And that was the moment that I looked down on the towpath of this canal, and I saw a shape that was different to all the other shapes. It was a stone that had a different shape. And I picked it up and looked at it carefully, and I thought, that looks like, like a Stone Age tool. And I felt it, it felt right in my hand, it felt extraordinary, it actually fitted my hand and it felt like a, a weapon or a scraper or something to, to perform a task. I took it to school, to my primary school, and it just so happened that one of the teachers, Mrs. Hutchinson, had a husband who worked at the British Museum. And she gave it to him and I waited for news. You know what it's like when you're a kid, one day can seem like a week, a week can seem like a month, I, I don't really exactly remember how long it was. But after about three weeks, she came back to me and said, that, that is a Stone Age tool. And to me, that was a real type of incredible magic. I had found a Stone Age tool. And that actually caused me to get interested in archaeology, and it actually influenced my whole life, finding that mysterious object. 
Now, that object actually left my life in an equally mysterious way because later it was actually stolen from me. It became my lucky charm. I used to travel with it. But it was actually stolen from me in a bag that was uh, stolen from me by a bunch of bandits on a journey uh, at uh, knife point at a certain point in my traveling career. So I lost that stone. And uh, I no longer have it. And that's a source of great regret. But what it did was it made me think about what I wanted to do in the future. And it steered me towards a course of thinking about and getting interested in archaeology and the Stone Age world. And later, after leaving school, I went to do archaeology at Durham University. And that was my uh, passion and my interest at that stage. I also did a lot of climbing, but the archaeology was very important to me. And I made several journeys out into um, Europe to the caves of France and to Altamira in Spain, and then later to Africa to explore the Stone Age paintings uh, from the Neolithic and uh, other eras in which you can actually witness and see hunting scenes on the, on the, the side of a, a cave wall. And to me, that seemed like an incredible type of magic. And at that point, I began to think, well, what does it take to, to be a hunter? And how do these communities actually start to learn to collaborate together and to learn to achieve their objectives, which is to feed the families that were living together. And one of the thoughts that came to me, which I wanted to share with you today, was to think about a group of individuals and to wonder where leadership actually began, right at the very heart of, of, of where it came from. And to do that, I want to think about four different characters. The first of those characters is Ugg. He is um, incredibly strong. He is phenomenally powerful. Is he the leader? Should he be the leader? Because he is the strongest of the team. The second is uh, Tug, and she is, has got incredible endurance and um, has got a, a, the ability to innovate with tools and can make incredible things. And finally, we've got Sug, and his ability is to skin and to prepare animals and to turn all those parts of the animal into um, uh, useful and valuable objects. So we've got three people with very different skills, and then at the, the end, we've got a character who is perhaps the quietest person in the team. And I'm going to call him Gary. And he is the one which becomes the leader. And the reason for that is that he is the one that understands the antelope. And he understands how the antelope behaves. And he has a passion, and perhaps for many years of his life has been out there, watching antelopes, seeing how through the course of a year, uh, the life of an antelope changes, and sometimes if a, a big storm comes in, they will run for the hills. And he knows that when it's the mating season, the males will behave in a certain way. And all of these things will be the reasons why his knowledge, his depth of knowledge, becomes an incredibly powerful tool. And if he can vocalize that and communicate what he knows and his passion for the subject in an effective way, that will mean that those individuals will catch more antelopes. And this is what I want to share with you today. You can be the quietest member of a team, and you can be its most powerful, powerful leader. The things that define you as an individual are the things that you don't have to do. They are the things that you are passionate about. And if you are looking for a sense of your own identity, you can find it very easily by looking at the things that you love, by looking at the, the sports that you love, by looking at the arts that you love, and we've seen some great examples of uh, fantastic performance today. So my idea is you can be the quietest member of a team and you can be its most fantastic leader. Now in the mountain world, in which I've also worked for about 20 years, that is definitely the case as well. Because the leader has the job of understanding that the summit of the mountain is the halfway point. When you are standing on the top of Mount Everest, you are halfway there. And not many people understand that. You actually need to have a depth of understanding for the mountain in order to be able to appreciate that that is the case, that when you stand on the summit of Mount Everest, you are actually at the halfway point of the journey. In addition, uh, commanding respect can be a matter of detail. It's what you know about the subject and how you communicate it, the history of the subject, who have you talked to, uh, who can share their knowledge with you. Um, are there books that you can read? Are there films that you can see? So often these things become ignored in the desperation and uh, enthusiasm to complete a, uh, a task or to get involved in something. Very often we forget to do our research. And great leaders that I've worked with are always people that, that have the care and the attention 
to, uh, to do that. But more than anything, I think at the heart of, of great leadership uh, is the ability to care for the individuals in the team. A team is a community. It's a community with a shared sense of vision and a shared sense of purpose. And the most brilliant leaders that I've ever worked with are the people who not just, don't just understand the antelope or understand the mountain, they are the people who can build a community and understand that it's important that people know each other, it's important that they uh, understand each other, that they understand each other's motivations, and all of those things form that magical, fundamental, mysterious glue uh, that makes a team that can perform under pressure. Now, when I've been in the mountains, sometimes I've seen incredible acts of generosity and courage. On other occasions, I've seen selfish obsession, in which people have become so obsessed in reaching the summit of that mountain that they, they somehow fail to be a human being and fail in their responsibilities to care in others. And very often, really quite surprisingly often, it's the teams that have the most stars within the team that are the most poisonous and which collapse into uh, recriminations, personality conflicts, all of those things can happen when a team is filled with star people who are basically competing against each other. And I think that's the fundamental thing. So to understand about the environment is one thing, but the ability to share your experiences with your fellow teammates and not to compete against them, but to appreciate that your success um, could be enhanced, the chances of your success could be massively enhanced by the ways in which you share and cooperate and collaborate with the people around you. As I said, on one occasion, uh, I've been very fortunate in having the opportunity to look out from the summit of Mount Everest. That was a, an extraordinary experience of my life, but I knew at that point the story wasn't over. We were halfway there. There will be fantastic challenges in your life. There will be Everests to come. And I hope that you will want to share and to collaborate and to look inside yourself for the passion which you can bring to the, pro to the projects that you do. And if you do, I really do believe that you can climb any mountain that you like. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.